Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us again tonight. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Carl Rubin. And I'm currently the chairperson of Israeli programming for the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, also known as FJMC. We are an international organization with 20,000 members worldwide. Membership is available to anybody as part of your synagogue. And if you don't have a synagogue or your synagogue doesn't participate, you're welcome to, to become an individual member. So indeed, it's open to anybody and everybody. Since the tragic events of October 7th, we have initiated a powerful program called Israel on My Mind. Israel on My Mind consists of two components. The first is a personal reflection where individuals are invited to, to submit a short piece of their personal connection with Israel. It could be a past experience that you've had with Israel, something currently going on, or even something in the future. The key is that it is a personal connection that you have with Israel. We then share many of the reflections that you send in with others on our website, which is fjmc.org. The second component of Israel on my mind is why we're here tonight. Every month we will be presenting a speaker who has some deep connection to Israel and will share with you their experience. These speakers can range from those with personal experiences such as our guest tonight, to those living and or working in Israel. We also plan to feature authors or writers with some connection to Israel and those involved with Israeli cooking, art, technology, or sports. If you have any ideas for future guests, please reach out to me. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome Rabbi Hillel Skolnick. Just to share a little bit of information about Rabbi Skolnick. First of all, he's a great guy. He's a mensch. He's a big supporter of FJMC and everybody I know. And I've had the pleasure of knowing Hillel for, for many years, and I consider him to be a very close friend and partner. Rabbi Hillel Boaz Skolnick was ordained at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in May of 2011. In the summer of 2011, Hillel and his family moved to Orlando to become the rabbi of the Southwest Orlando Jewish Congregation. Born in New York, Rabbi Hillel spent his entire childhood in Forest Hills, Queens. He's a graduate of both the Solomon Schechter School of Queens and the Solomon Schechter High School of Long Island. Before beginning at Brandeis in 2002, Rabbi Hillel spent the year in Israel as a participant in the Nativ Leadership Program, where he enjoyed learning at the conservative yeshiva, as well as volunteering in the potato and carrot fields of Kibbutz Saad. In December of 2005, he graduated from Brandeis Cum Laude, earning degrees in politics and Near Eastern Judaic studies. Rabbi Hillel enjoyed many summers at Camp Ramah in the Berkshires, first as a camper, then as a counselor, uh, and then operations manager, and, and many other positions. Rabbi Hillel has also completed a unit of clinical pastoral education and act, had, has acted as Bellevue Hospital in Manhattan's chaplain. In addition, Rabbi Hillel has served for a year as a rabbinic intern and Hebrew school principal at the Shelter Rock Jewish Center in Rossell, New York. After serving as the rabbi of the Southwest Orlando Jewish congregation for seven years, Rabbi Hillel and his family moved to Columbus in the summer of 2018, where he now serves as senior rabbi at Congregation to Fareth Israel. Rabbi Hillel is a member of the extended executive of the World Zionist Organization, a board member of the American Zionist Movement, and of Merkaz USA. Rabbi Hillel also serves on the board of the Jewish Day School. Needless to say, Rabbi Skolnick has been a lifetime fervent supporter of Israel. Since October 7th, he has visited Israel three times and has another trip planned for next week. Welcome, Rabbi Skolnick. Thank you, and thank you, Carl, and thank you uh, to the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs for inviting me to join this evening. Um, I want to say a special good evening as well to Rabbi Rauscher, uh, who's a dear friend who I've known for many years. Actually, Rabbi Rauscher uh, and my wife and I my wife is also a rabbi, and um, we were all in Israel together as part of our Israel year during rabbinical school. I was uh, frantically trying to find a picture from back in those days, but my uh, just searching skills on my computer were not fast enough. Uh, but when Rabbi Rasher has a chance to sit down, maybe he'll find one and we can uh, see what I used to look like back then. And Rabbi Rasher still looks great with his full head of hair. I have a little bit less than I did back in those days. Um, but it's wonderful to be with all of you, and thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for being part of our conversation this evening. 
um, because Israel is very much on my mind and I know very much on everyone's mind. Uh, as Carl mentioned, I've had the really surprising and um, unfortunately precious opportunity to be in Israel several times since October 7th, um, with the fourth time coming up this coming Sunday. Uh, and with your permission, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about the different trips, the different reasons why I've gone to Israel and why I'm going again. Um, I will tell you that my daughter is my 15 year old daughter. We have three kids. My 15 year old daughter is on the other side of the table, um, expressing her version of jealousy of the fact that as of Sunday, I will have been in Israel uh, more times since October 7th than she's had the opportunity to be over the course of her life. She's been three times, so it's nothing to nothing to laugh at. Um, but it's, as I said, been this really odd thing that I've just had this chance to go a few times. Um, I, I imagine also some of you had a chance to hear from Stan Greenspan uh, in a previous edition of Israel on my mind. Um, I'm going to try not to review too much of what Stan said. Uh, two of the times that I've been there uh, have been with Stan. Uh, he's become a bit of a travel buddy for me. Uh, and if you've ever traveled with Stan, you know that is exciting and adventurous, um, but also wonderful and fun. Um, and the truth of the matter is um, the times that I've been to Israel since October 7th, I've had moments of smile and moments of great happiness and fun, uh, but also, of course, tremendous number of moments of just uh, heartache and pain uh, and sadness uh, that then inevitably also leads to moments of inspiration um, and moments of just sheer awe uh, in the way that uh, our friends and loved ones and brothers and sisters and family in Israel uh, continue to put one foot in front of the other. Uh, the November trip, I, I was there in November uh, with the Masorti mission, uh, so leader uh, leaders of the Masorti movement around the world, uh, Masorti and the United Synagogue and the conservative movement as a whole, uh, working together to guide those who practice Judaism in the ways that we do. I was honored to be invited to participate in that mission, uh, which took place uh, in early November. So it was just a few weeks after the attacks of October 7th. Uh, and the point of that trip uh, was really to go and to see and to witness uh, and to uh, be there to uh, physically, but also emotionally in whatever way possible, uh, embrace any people that we encountered. Uh, for me, that experience actually began when I got on the plane um, because I sat down next to uh, an Israeli woman, a young woman who hadn't been to Israel since October 7th. She actually hadn't been since the summer. She lived in San Francisco and she was going back to see her family for the first time since the attacks of October 7th. And uh, though we spent some time watching movies, I don't remember what she was watching or what I was watching, but we spent a lot of time on the plane talking with each other. Uh, and from a uh, perspective of a rabbi who tries really hard to be uh, Menachem Avelim, which is to say, to be there to offer words of comfort to someone who is in mourning, um, it was really fascinating to me that just the act of sitting on the plane uh, was an opportunity that I had to really sit and support uh, and feel supported as well. One of the lasting things for me from that trip, uh, which was filled with anguish and pain, and we went to Kfar Aza, which was a kibbutz near the uh, near the Gaza border, uh, which lost so many people and has people from it still being held hostage in Gaza. Uh, but one of the things that stays with me also is the fact that when I was in Israel in November, when I encountered Israelis here and there, and also members of my own family who I had a chance to see briefly at the end of the week, um, they, in addition to being appreciative of the fact that we were there, kept asking me how I was doing, which just stunned me to no end uh, because of the awful things that they had been going through and were continuing to go through and still go through, of course. But they also recognized so much, and I believe continue to do so, um, that our lives here in the United States or Canada um, and outside of Israel as a whole are far from easy as active members of the Jewish community, that the rampant rise in anti-Semitism affects the way that we act, the way that we dress, the way that we clothe ourselves, whether we wear a yarmulke or not, 
or if we wear a Magin David, a Jewish star or not. These are questions that people are forced to ask themselves. Uh, and the fact that even in the midst of their grief, in the midst of their anguish, family and friends and people in Israel were asking how we were doing, um, to me was just unbelievable and a statement of the incredible compassion and kindness, um, but also the fact that they really get that being a Jew somewhere outside of Israel is not always simple and not always easy. Um, the December trip, and I'll show a few pictures in a few moments to sort of illustrate the things that I'm talking about. Uh, the December trip um, was actually my wife and our three children and I went to Israel for nine days over winter break. Uh, we at Congregation Tiferet Israel here in Columbus uh, had been planning to do a congregational trip to Israel in December. And when the attacks of October 7th took place, uh, people, of course, uh, immediately started to wonder, though I will add, um, with great compassion, waited a tremendous amount of time to ask um, whether or not our trip would ultimately go. And unfortunately, it was seemingly inevitable that we weren't going to be able to go on this congregational trip. And the truth of the matter is our family of five we had always said, even if the congregational trip didn't happen, we were going to go. This was before October 7th. Um, and my wife and I were kind of on the fence of whether or not we were going to still go. Uh, our kids also were a little bit nervous about the concept of going to Israel. Uh, what really changed the plans for us was actually the rally in Washington, D.C. in November. Um, we brought all three kids to the rally and the opportunity and the experience of being there together with it was like 300,000 people um, and recognizing what it means to show up really um, not only changed the view of my wife and me of, of just being there, but also of our children and understanding so much the power of being counted and, and showing with your presence what it means to be in Israel. So we went in December, um, we bought tickets, we flew El Al, which is the only thing I've had a chance to fly since October 7th, since until like a couple of weeks ago when United started flying again to Israel. Um, that was really the choice. So we got on the plane and we went and we had an apartment in Jerusalem. Uh, we did some volunteer projects. Again, I will show you. Um, and we had a combination of beautiful and wonderful and inspiring time. Uh, we stayed in the center part of the country, did not take the kids down toward uh, the Gaza envelope, and um, just were able to be there. And again, showing people in Israel what it means to say uh, that I'm still going to go to Israel, even though these times are challenging and difficult, uh, was tremendously powerful for us. Um, and I think powerful for them too, particularly for, again, for family. Um, my father's mother, excuse me, my father's sister made Aliyah about 35, 40 years ago with her husband. Um, and they have five kids and a number of grandchildren, all of whom I love um, and have had wonderful relationship with over the course of my life. Um, but it was really the first time that they looked at me and said, wow, Hillel, we just like totally are, you know, impressed by what you're doing. Uh, I've spent my whole life being impressed by the things that they do, the service that they give um, to the country, to Israel, in their army service, for their children, for all the things that they do. Um, but it was really incredible to see what it meant to them to show up. And ultimately, that is something that I hope you all instinctively know. But if you haven't heard it yet, hear it now. Um, if you have the opportunity to go, it's worth going, um, both for your own personal neshama, for your soul, um, but also because it really does a tremendous amount of chizuk, it does a tremendous amount of support to people there, to see people showing up to Israel. Um, and they get it, and they understand it, and they recognize it, um, and it is a beautiful thing. Uh, so that was the December trip. The February trip uh, was actually uh, to participate in a conference for Merkaz in preparation uh, for the World Zionist Congress elections, which are taking place in either 2025 or 2026. I will try really hard not to use this forum as a chance to remind you too many times that voting in the World Zionist Congress elections are tremendously important, but they are, and you all should. Um, as I mentioned before, I am a member of the extended executive of the World Zionist Organization. Uh, don't ask me to try to explain all the different parts of what it means because I'll just use all of my time with that. Uh, but of course, the representation in the World Zionist Congress is proportional to the number of votes 
that we get in the World Zionist Congress elections. A full third of those votes in the World Zionist Congress are allocated to the United States in particular based on the number of votes that we get in proportion to the other party. So the more votes that we get, the more seats we have in the Congress, the more money we can allocate toward people in Israel and around the world who need this incredible amount of funding um, to support doing Judaism the same way that we do Judaism, to support us here in the United States as well. Um, not to mention the fact that an organization like Karen Kayema Israel, like the Jewish National Fund, which has really quite an impressive budget, um, their plans of what they do, their strategies and their agenda is set in much the same way based on number of seats on the board of JNF, which is given out, again, based on the number of votes that are had in the World Zionist Congress. So an issue like climate change, uh, which is something that the Jewish National Fund can take on and tackle, is only going to be an important issue if we have the people helping to run the organization, which we only get by the votes. Okay, end of reminder to vote in the Merkaz USA elections. Uh, the final trip that is coming up, um, God willing, won't be my final trip, but uh, the fourth one that Carl mentioned uh, begins this coming Sunday. Um, in addition to these chances to go, I very much wanted to bring others to Israel as well. Um, and actually working with a synagogue in Chicago, uh, Rabbi Jeremy Fine and B'nai Tikva um, in outside Chicago in the suburbs. So we are working together, taking 19 people from here in Columbus and in Chicago uh, for a four day mission to both volunteer and also to bear witness. Uh, we're planning to go to the site of the Nova Music Festival um, and to do some agricultural volunteering, uh, God willing to visit um, those who just need us to be present in the room, whether it's wounded soldiers or people who have suffered or had losses. Um, and we'll, of course, go to Kikar HaTufim to Hostage Square, um, which is an incredibly powerful experience, uh, whether you were there in October or November or December. Um, there is a prayer service that takes place there every day at five o'clock, hosted by the Masorti movement, um, praying for the hostages, for their well-being, for their speedy and safe return to the loving embrace of their family. But every day that service ends with the same idea, which is to say, we hope and pray that we won't have to have this service tomorrow. But if God forbid we still do, we'll be back here at exactly the same time in exactly the same place. Um, to be there and to stand with others um, is unbelievable. We, uh, When we were there in December as a family, uh, we were sitting leading the service and one of the elderly women who had previously been a hostage who had just been released a few weeks before just walked like right past us. It's a very just jarring experience of you just don't know who you're going to see and it's incredible and powerful um, and obviously a must go. Um, but it's also a must pray that you don't have to go by the time you get there. All right, I'm going to share my screen for a couple minutes and uh, just show you some pictures to illustrate uh, some of the things that I was talking about. So, All right, so uh, this is a picture from our mission. It's, uh, if you were here with Stan, Stan is over here. Uh, if you can't find Stan, uh, but these are the people who were there for the Masorti mission. I did very bad planning in terms of where I was going to stand. I'm right over here if you're trying to find me. Um, this, of course, is President Herzog uh, and his wife. Uh, and this uh, wonderful man is the new president of the Rabbinical Assembly as well. Um, so it was an opportunity to go, as I said, and to meet. We got the chance to talk to President Herzog, um, but also to have the opportunity to uh, see people and to bear witness, as I mentioned before. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Carl's just telling you, please ask me questions. Please do. Uh, all right. And so we'll continue. Um, this was a, a picture that I wanted to share to say that in the same time as um, things have been awful and terrible, um, Israel continues to be a place of incredible culture. Um, this is the new national library that just opened up that there was supposed to be a big celebration for. It had to be postponed. Um, but this is a, a gorgeous, stunning place that uh, has people going and doing research and amazing. Um, this woman is Sarah Citrin, who uh, actually is in the United States at the moment, um, but made Aliyah a number of years ago. And if you don't follow her posts on Facebook um, about her experience living in Israel, I would certainly encourage you to. Um, so now a few of the volunteer projects that we did. Uh, this is my wife, Sharon, our oldest, uh, Daphna, and our middle son, Liav, and our daughter, Hadar. I know your name, you're Daphna. 
you're in the picture. Yeah, my daughter wanted to know why I mentioned her name. Uh, anyway, we were uh, at a place in Jerusalem called Pantry Packers, which actually existed before uh, October 7th. They have been packing uh, things for people within Israeli society who um, just are uh, not quite um, able to support themselves. Uh, we that they were actually packing coffee beans. You can see me holding them. Um, so there's tasks for everyone. You, uh, my daughter is standing on the ladder. You pour the beans into the thing. You push the button. They come down. You hold them in the bag, and then you label them. Um, and we packed some 220, 250 bags of coffee beans to be given out to those who need them. Um, and uh, it was very powerful and physical. Uh, and you can see I'm wearing the same shirt in the picture that I'm wearing tonight. So uh, you can tell it's really me. Uh, yeah, I didn't notice that before now, but it's pretty funny. Um, this is the second project that we were doing. This is our son, Liav. Uh, my wife has a, a friend named Tova. Uh, she often goes by Tova in the Rova because she actually lives in the Rova, which is the Jewish quarter. And she uh, owns an art studio uh, that is in the Jewish quarter, which I would encourage you to visit. Uh, she makes beautiful things. But when the war broke out, she switched her um, art studio into what's called a chamal, which is a cheder mil Um And so she has basically been a place of collecting supplies for soldiers. Um, and so in her art studio, she just has like piles and bags and this and that. Um, and people call her from all over the country, unfortunately, with the challenges that are taking place in the north they call from there as well and say tova can you get me 20 bulletproof vests or can you get me helmets or can you get me socks or can you get me all of those things and she taught us also about um the supplies that are needed or had been needed and might continue to be needed in these cases um as i'm sure many of you know and many of you participated in in the days after october 7th there was a huge incredible response from the worldwide jewish community of not just sending supplies, but also generosity and sending dollars and shekels and Canadian dollars and whatever currency you have um, to support Israel. But it matters that you're sending the right thing also. So we got to learn about the difference between this kind of helmet and that kind of helmet and this kind of bulletproof vest and that kind of bulletproof vest. And while we were there, um, we packed some things for her as well. Uh, our third project was on a uh, moshav called Bekoa. Um, which uh, has this really um, beautiful farm called Hava Be'ahava, Hava, of course, meaning love. Um, and uh, they usually had a whole lot of people, many of them from uh, the Far East, uh, who would harvest their carrots and other people who worked there. Uh, but they did not have all of their workers because of people needing to leave the country and people being in the army. Um, so they needed volunteers to come and help harvest their carrots out of their fields. Uh, so the youngest you can see is Hadar holding up some carrots that uh, we picked out of the ground. Uh, for me, it was a really transformative experience because, as Carl mentioned, before college, I was on the Nativ program, and uh, I spent a semester living on Kibbutz Sa'ad, which itself is in the Gaza envelope, um, and uh, had a very challenging day on October 7th. Uh, fewer casualties than many other places, but very challenging, and I'll come back to Kibbutzah in a second, um, but I used to spend a lot of time laying pipes and removing pipes in carrot fields. Uh, this was a chance to actually pull the carrots out of the ground. Um, it was dirty, it was sweaty, and it was really very special. I threw this picture in here also because while we were there, I don't know if anybody recognizes these two, but this is Rabbi Paul and Nina Friedman. Uh, Paul Friedman was the director of United Synagogue Youth of USY for many years before making Aliyah. Um, and uh, it's never a trip to Israel if you've uh, gotten to know Paul and Nina without bumping into them, as I had the chance to do. Um, for many, many years, USY groups uh, and Ramah groups and other groups also would go to Paul and Nina's house for Sudachli Sheet on Shabbat afternoon. Um, and uh, getting to bump into them is always a special thing. Uh, and this is a picture of getting to see uh, my family, my aunt and uncle and some of their children and their kids. Um, but a chance for our children to get to know them and get to see them was very special, as I said before, um, to the extent that my daughter is on Instagram with uh, her cousins now, which is really very special and beautiful. Uh, one second. Let me, Stephen, I see your question. I'm going to come back to it in one second. Let me just uh, do this picture. Um, so these are two very special people. This is Asher and Achinoam Golan, um, who were my kibbutz parents when I lived on Kibbutz Saad. Uh, 
Um, and as I said, Kibbutz Zad is really in the Gaza envelope with the vets, right across the street, actually, from Kfar Aza, uh, which is one of the places that Stan and I visited when we were there in November. Um, they have been living uh, in the, not in the Dead Sea, but by the Dead Sea since then. Um, though Asher has been going back to the kibbutz more and more. Uh, but Achinoam is concerned and worried, as she should. Not sure that it should really be her job to be the first line of defense. Um, and God forbid, such a situation where Hamas were to attack again. Um, and it had been many years since I'd had a chance to see them, but getting to be together with them is just uh, tremendously, tremendously special. Um, we were also there um, at a time when my wife's cousin had had her first child, a son, uh, 30 days earlier, and uh, we got to attend his Pidyon Haben. The Pidyon Haben is a wonderful ceremony that takes place uh, when a child, when a baby boy, as the firstborn child, um, without being born by a cesarean section, without um, any miscarriages before, um, and it dates back to the idea that originally it was going to be the firstborns who were going to be in temple service, but then uh, there was a change of plan that it became the Levi'im, the Levites. And so there's a practice of redeeming the child at 30 days. It's an unusual ceremony nowadays. Um, so when you have the opportunity to participate in one, um, you take that chance. And as it happened, we were there for one in the family, which was very special. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for one second, just so that way I can uh, see the questions and uh, answer them as best I can. So I found sure. Stephen's question, which was about people reunited despite prior political diversity. How does Israel public respond to the UN and other leaders who have traditionally been very supportive of Israel now calling for a ceasefire? Do they feel alone? And Sharon wrote, how do you explain to your children the events and what are their responses and concerns? All right, two excellent questions on uh, drastically related but different topics. Um, Stephen, I appreciate your question. And to be honest with you, um, I'm anxious to find out the answer to that question next week, to be able to have uh, face to face conversations with people in Israel. Um, I think that there's an extent to which and this is my own um, sense of things, but uh, I think it's a fairly accurate sense of things. Um, I, I do think that there is an extent to which in Israel, they are feeling more alone on the world stage, certainly than they were a few months ago. Uh, but I think if we were being honest with ourselves in the days after October 7th and the weeks after, we probably knew that there was going to be a time limit to which the world actors and major players were going to be as publicly supportive before they started to change their tune. Um, though I personally find myself disappointed by the changes of tune, it's disappointment, it's not surprise. Um, for me, personally, and this is, you know, for me personally, I, I think that there is an extent to which there are elements in Israel that will say we are just going to go it alone, if need be, hopeful that that does not come to transpire, um, and more hopeful for the fact that um, before that comes to pass, that something can be negotiated or created or even manufactured seemingly out of thin air um, that would see the return of those who continue to be held captive. Um, I think what becomes continually clear on a daily basis, though, is that um, it's not always seeming like that is a real possibility. And I don't know how you stop fighting if Hamas is still there and the hostages are not released. I just, I don't know that. And I personally have a lot of trouble standing in judgment of a country that it wants to bring its people home. Now I will say, and I will share openly and honestly with all of you, um, I have a heart and I have compassion and I have sadness for the immense loss of life that is taking place in this battle and in this war. Um, and I also think that when you are the one who makes the incredibly challenging and difficult and painful decision to fire a rocket or pull the trigger to fire a bullet or any kind of something that is destructive with the potential for loss of life in an act of war, you have to take responsibility for that and you have to own up to it and you have to understand it. And you can't just say, I bear no cause in anything. Uh, and yet at the same time, for me, the biggest cause of disappointment and frustration is the fact that the players on the world stage 
um, seem to both forget about the hostages, forget about who's holding them, and ha have pushed themselves away from the message and the needed message um, that ultimately um, it is Hamas who are terrorists in this situation uh, and not Israel and not the Jews. And that to me is as disappointing. And while I think there are definitely people in Israel who feel alone, uh, I'll tell you, Stephen, as a Jew, I feel supported by my fellow Jews. But in that way, I personally um, often feel very alone. And it's sad. Um, it's just it's just sad. Uh, and Sharon, to answer your question about the events of October 7th, um, it's an interesting question because it depends on the kid and it depends on the age. Um, our oldest, Sharon, you know, Daphna, um, uh, you know, she has a phone and she has a smartphone and she has Instagram and she has this and she has that. Uh, so she is exposed a lot more to things than our nine-year-old. Um, but there have certainly been times since October 7th that we've tried to, uh, I can't say we've been successful always, but we've tried to sort of curtail what she is seeing and what she's not seeing. Um, but I think one of the things that's been challenging for parents of kids of any age um, is how do you help them process? And it's not just processing the images that we all remember from October 7th. It's continuing to process the fact that people who they encounter out there in the world are going to potentially have very different opinions about things. Um, even kids and friends or people who they thought were friends um, or teachers or uh, fellow students or just people out there in the world. Um, and that is something that requires continued support and continued uh, just engagement with with your children. But every child is, of course, different, and not every kid can handle it in the same way. Um, in the days after October 7th, it was just seeing the things that we were seeing, you were fearful about what anybody else was going to see. And that, in some ways, continues to be true. Uh, but I also think that taking them to Israel helped to remind them um, that what we see in the media is not always the experience of every single person on the ground. Um, though I will say since October 7th, um, especially in the days and weeks, particularly immediately after that, um, you know, it was terrifying. Uh, I saw something on the news today that said up to like half a million Israelis are, there's a worry that they're going to have PTSD from this, uh, which I thought was just a ridiculous headline for two reasons. Number one, um, you can't call it post-traumatic stress disorder until the trauma is actually finished. Um, and if you talk to people in Israel, they'll tell you it's still October 8th or 7th there. So you're not in the post-traumatic stress, number one. Number two, everyone in Israel, everyone who was, you know, experiencing October 7th and all of us in our own ways um, have PTSD from that. So to say half a million people is like, you know, no, it's, it's, it's everybody. Um, and we should understand that and, uh, you know, be honest about that, too. So, uh, Rabbi, I have a couple questions here that were sent in earlier. Uh, All right. Some, some are sort of personal in nature. Some are more sort of global. But we'll just start with a tough one. How does Israel's current prosecution of its war reconcile a belief in tikkun alone with the horrific events such as starvation in Gaza amongst civilians? Oh, well, starting off with a, with a, you know, yeah, thanks, Carl. Um, Pleasure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, I, 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 to whomever asked that question, uh, first of all, I, I want you to know that I think it's a question that is on the minds of many people, and it's certainly on my mind. Um, I also find it very helpful um, to differentiate for myself uh, between sometimes policies of uh, a current government I'll put all my cards on the table, right? I mean, this is being recorded, but you can ask Carl. Um, you know, I, I actually spoke a couple of weeks ago about how I was in Israel a year ago, January, for a World Zionist organization, something. And it was like week three of the Saturday evening protests against the proposed change to the judiciary um, and the proposed change that thankfully has also fallen by the wayside even before October 7th um, about the potential change in the law of return. Um, and those protests were just getting started. And I was there um, uh, on a Saturday night in Jerusalem in the very early days of those protests, which of course grew to hundreds of thousands of people and created, interestingly, the infrastructure that really acted as support 
when the government wasn't doing what a government is supposed to do in the days after October 7th and really since then. Um, so I think oftentimes about the concept of differentiating between um, a government of a country which I love, but a government which, with which I have fervent and passionate and strong disagreement with their policies and the people, let's not forget the people who sit in the government who I, I mean, disagree with is not even close to a strong enough term. Um, and at the same time, the love that I have for the country and the people and the individual soldiers who, um, you know, the ones who I know are just wonderful and kind and compassionate people who would rather be doing really anything than having to fight in Gaza, especially the people who are in Miluim, who are in their reserve duty, um, who had completed their army service, people who had, you know, finished their time in Miluim, who had reached that age but went back, people who had said, I'm not going to serve in my reserve duty under this particular sitting government, and on October 7th said, all right, I need a new set of army clothes because I'm going to sit in my tank or to um, you know, be there to, to support and to guard my country and to fight for the people whom I love. Um, you know, I, I adore them and I love them and I stand with them. Um, and as I said before, I think if you're a person in the fight, you have to recognize the fact that when you're fighting, you do cause damage and you cause loss of life. Uh, but I think there's also a big difference between the way that we feel perhaps about a government of a country and the people in that country. And that is how I differentiate uh, for myself. Um, it is painful and difficult and awful to recognize the fact that in this endeavor to eradicate Hamas to the extent that that might be possible, um, there is tremendous loss of life and harm um, and irreparable damage that's being done to people and to just, you know, ourselves and our souls and the souls of others. Um, but I also don't really think that the concept of tikkun olam means that you have to sit there and allow yourself to be a target from now until forever. Uh, and uh, I really can't find myself standing in judgment of the people whom I know and whom I love who are risking their lives um, to make sure that our opportunity to make the world a better place is one that we can do in safety and security. Another question, how have your thoughts about Israel changed since October 7th? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I don't want to put Carl or Sharon or Doug or any of the other members of uh, Congregation for Earth Israel who are uh, here this evening um, into any kind of uh, panic mode. Uh, but I will say, you know, my wife and I have talked many times over the course of our uh, almost 18 years of marriage of uh, the concept of making Aliyah um, and of moving to Israel. And I will say, when I go to Israel, as I've been going rather frequently, um, but when I've gone to Israel in general, I have always found it hard to come back to the United States. In fact, um, before I went in November, um, one of the things that I said on Shabbat before I left was, recalling a story from the end of Nativ, actually, um, when I came back into the United States and I was in passport control in John F. Kennedy Airport, New York, um, and I handed my passport to the border control person and they handed it back to me, they stamped it and they said, welcome home. Um, and I said to myself, that like doesn't feel right because I was just home. And one of the things that I said in my sermon before my November trip was that I just was really praying really hard that the person who was at passport control wouldn't say anything like that. And God bless the person. They just stamped my passport and handed it back to me, which was good because I was exhausted and it was five o'clock in the morning. Um, but one of the things that has changed in my mind, to be honest, is that it gets harder and harder and harder um, to leave the country um, because I feel such a connection and I feel so at home there. Um, and also, when you go into Israel and when you leave Israel, um, they have the pictures of the hostages lining the ramp when you go into Israel and when you leave Israel. And it is just awful to walk past them and to feel like you're walking past them. Um, you know in your heart and in your mind that you're not abandoning them because we take the 
the responsibility of continuing to be with them in our hearts and in our minds and in our prayers and in our actions very seriously. Um, I will also say one more thing. Um, uh, you may have seen my arm going around in gesticulating ways. Um, I wear four things on my wrist uh, and one thing around my neck. Um, so this is a bracelet that was given to me when I was in Israel in November, um, which says bring them home now. Um, this was made, I thought it was by my daughter, but she claims it was made by my wife. It's just a little bracelet that says Israel on it. Um, this I also picked up along the way, which is uh, through the World Zionist Organization, uh, which says, uh, uh, to remember those who are lost, to bring back the hostages and to uh, be victorious. And this is uh, the phrase, Yachad uh, which means uh, together we will emerge victorious, which has sort of been an anthem in Israel. Um, and this is, uh, you may have seen this also, the sort of uh, tag um, that says, Halev Shelanu Shavui Ve'aza, which means our heart. Um, is held captive in Gaza and says, bring them home now. Um, it was funny. I was saying this the other day to somebody. I don't know if, uh, to me, it makes me think of the Lord of the Rings. Um, I apologize for the sort of strange reference, but if you can follow me for a second, um, you know, in the Lord of the Rings, when Frodo is wearing the ring on him and then he takes it off every once in a while and you can sort of see this like, you know, big burden sort of lifted off of him when he simply takes it off. Um, you know, the burden that I carry is nothing as compared to the burden that so many other carry. Um, but it feels a little bit like purposely and appropriately carrying a burden with me every day. Um, and by wearing these things around my wrist and by wearing this around my neck every day, wherever I go, um, it keeps me connected and it keeps me focused. Not that I could be unconnected even if I wanted to, which I don't, or even if I would try, which I wouldn't. Um, but, you know, that's another way that my thinking is always focused on it. Very good. A couple more questions in the chat and the Q&A. Uh, question is, how can Israel negotiate with terrorists whose agenda is to eradicate them? And, and I think that question speaks for many of us over a long period of time, but we're curious for your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, look, I have two thoughts, probably more. I don't know why I've assigned numbers. Um, thought number one is, yeah, you can. I mean, because I say oftentimes one of my starting places in interfaith dialogue, which I am just anxious always to be a part of and appreciate, and I've had many wonderful interfaith experiences in the world, is that the reason they're successful is because we're not working from a starting perspective of, in order for me to practice my religion, you have to be gone and done and dead with, or I have to convince you that you're wrong. Um, we can understand and appreciate the fact that you can practice your religion in peace, and I can practice my religion in peace, and then we can also talk and we can have our similar but also very different celebrations and understandings of the world and not have to annihilate each other in order to be fulfilled. Um, that's not true. You're right when you're talking about terrorism and terrorists. And so it's impossible to negotiate because it just doesn't work. And not to mention the fact that I, I, there has to be some element of recognition by the world that how is it at all appropriate to have to say in a negotiation one hostage for anything more than one other person? Uh, look, let's also acknowledge the fact that people shouldn't be taken hostage in the first place. So you're already doing something that is insane that you should have to do in the first place. But what one hostage or one remains of a hostage for however many people or bodies or, or, or people who have tried or would like to try to kill you, it's it's already an insane concept. And so the second thing is, on the other hand, uh, you know, I, I don't know who else you're going to negotiate with. That's number one. Find me somebody else to negotiate with. We should negotiate with them. There are other people. Um, and if they have power, then they should negotiate with them. And they should have more power. And I would like for them to assume more control and for the people to give them the control to then not be at the hands of terrorist groups. This would be a very good thing. We'd like that. That would create that situation and what you hope and what you pray and what you yearn for um, is that what has happened in you know past times of 
leaders who have fought to the ends of the earth in battle um, and have eventually found a way to say the battle is over um, and now comes the peace time, um, that something like that should be able to transpire also. Um, I nurture that hope and I nurture that prayer in my heart because I need it to be there. Um, I wish I could say that uh, I have more confidence that it would, you know, come to fruition tomorrow. Um, but at the end of the day, you're right. It's how do you negotiate with terrorists? I don't know. Um, but until somebody else is there at the negotiating table, you also have to bring the hostages home. Another question from Dr. Mandel, which which is so prevalent and such an issue. How do you support members of your congregation and or community? who are suffering, including mental distress from anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. I'm aware of the anti-Semitism on campus at The Ohio State University. What do you say to give us hope? Oh, well, uh, you know, you hope that you're able to find the right words in some sort of coherent sentence. Um, but I would also say to them, Dr. Mandel, that I think we all suffer from it. Um, I was actually at a, at a program last week uh, for the National Alliance of Mental Illness, NAMI. I believe I'm saying what it is correctly. Um, and it was focused not on anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, um, but on the concept just of mental health and mental illness in the country and in the world in the first place. And I think the first step to recognizing uh, the truth of the matter is that when it comes to the mental health and mental illness concern, particularly in the Jewish community, is that it's not only particular people, I think it's everybody. I think we're all suffering in this moment. Um, and we have to be able to acknowledge that and to say it out loud together um, and to respond together uh, and to recognize the fact that our synagogues have to be safe spaces for people um, of varieties of opinions, um, but also places that people can go to feel like they can um, you know, get away from the things that they face in the rest of the outside world. Uh, the Ohio State University campus has been a challenging place to be, as have been so many other campuses in tremendously disappointing ways. Um, and it has made life incredibly hard for many, many people. And even if you're not on campus, um, you know, you're understanding that it's out there in the world and um, it's painful and it's hard and it's it's just burdensome. Um, what do we say to give each other hope? Um, we say that as Jews, we've been through difficult times before. And we've come through them and persevered through them, and I have no doubt that we will in this moment. Um, but I think we're also remembering the lesson of our history. Um, you know, we're, I hope I'm not the first person to tell you that we're coming up on Passover soon, right? And one of the things that we say on Pesach is Bechol Dor Vador Chayav Adam Lirot Et Atzmo Ki Ilu Hu Yatsam in Mitzrayim, which is to say that in every generation we have to feel like we ourselves were redeemed from Egypt, and that has an obvious message of bringing the bringing the hostages home, and that's clear. Um, but what it also means is um, if we had been of the opinion that we had reached the point in the history of the Jewish people that we didn't have to worry about some new endeavor of anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism that was going to try to make us feel like we shouldn't be Jewish or we shouldn't be lovers or supporters of the state of Israel, um, then we shouldn't have been thinking that way. So another troubling question. Uh, and I'm hope, hoping this is a minority that, that this person is referring to. But the question is, what do you say to a member of your congregation who now believes Israel doesn't have the right to exist? Uh, yeah, I see the question, Tom, and I appreciate you asking it. Um, I am relieved to say that uh, I have not had a member of the congregation who's come to me and said that. Um, I, I am always ready to sit down and dialogue um, and to recognize the fact that dialogue means dialogue. It doesn't mean necessarily trying to convince a person of what you're right um, or they're wrong. Um, but I also recognize the fact that one of the big challenges of this kind of dialogue is that when you sit down to talk to somebody in the hopes of making them recognize that something they say may not be correct, you also have to 
uh, put forth yourself and be vulnerable in a way that you might have a realization of something that you said wasn't correct. Um, and it would be very difficult to get into such a version of a conversation with a member of the shul or just a person in general who's trying to talk to me about Israel not having the right to exist. Um, you know, if push came to shove, uh, you know, after dialogue and after time and contemplation and consideration, and I would imagine a number of conversations and talking with uh, the wonderful lay leaders that we have in our congregation, uh, we're a synagogue that believes that Israel does have the right to exist. Um, and if there's a place that you want to go to find your spiritual home, um, that's going to be a place that says out loud that Israel doesn't have a right to exist. I'm a big believer in people belonging to the shul that's right for them. Um, and I'm very proud of the work that we do at Congregation to Earth Israel. Um, and I think we have a wonderful synagogue, wonderful spiritual opportunities and educational chances and social things going on um, and a great synagogue. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right spiritual place for everyone. And I'd much rather somebody be in the right spiritual place for them. Um, and if that's somewhere else, that makes me sad. But sometimes that's the right answer. Amen. Uh, let's go with one more question and we'll wrap things uh, up. I, I forgot to say that the first thing that I do, though, is tell them to go speak to Doug Segerman and then they come. <laughs> oh, well. Any additional thoughts you'd like to share about Israel today and what you see for the future of Israel? And that's wide open, as we know. But Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, first of all, thank you again for having me. Um, thank you, Bruce, for uh, wonderful tech support also, and um, to everybody for joining us. I'm touched by the number of people um, who have joined from all parts of the country um, and from other countries potentially as well. Um, listen, I, I, you know, I, I don't imagine that my life is going to continue with the going to Israel like once a month or once every other month version of what it's been the past four months. Um, I'm cognizant of the fact that I'm going now in March with no real plan of exactly when I'm going back. Um, I imagine at the latest, I'd be back in December for the rabbinical assembly convention, though, um, if things bring me to Israel sooner, that would, of course, be wonderful. Um, and that's weighing on my mind, too. Um, I, my worry is not for the existence of the state of Israel, not from the existential point. Um, I do worry about the soul and the spirit of the country uh, from the perspective of the current sitting government um, that I think, and this is my personal thought, doesn't represent Jewish Men's Club, doesn't represent Congregation to Fight Israel, just represents Hillel's thoughts. Um, but I do think that the continuation of the government and the people who are included in the government um, does strip Israel of moral authority and moral value that it needs in its soul and needs on the world stage. Um, but it's also a democracy, and the best way to overthrow the government is through a vote of no confidence. And I don't vote in Israel. I'm not a member of the Knesset. Um, and though I continually encourage my members and members of my family to vote in the World Zionist Congress elections, because that's our way to participate, and we should, um, you know, I, I wait for that day to happen because I think new voices and new vision um, are very much needed. Um, and so I do worry for the sort of spiritual soul of the country in this moment. Um, but it's not a worry that the country won't exist in a week or a month or a year. Um, but, you know, I'd like it to be an even uh, more spiritual and more welcoming and kinder and compassionate place. Um, because I think there's opportunity for that. And, you know, the, the really just terrible and ironic thing um, is that in the Middle East, Israel is actually the best, most secure place to be for so many different minority groups, um, you know, of many different religions and creeds who are able to find success and happiness in life uh, living in Israel, uh, you know, for members of the LGBTQ plus community, Israel is like the only place that you can be. Uh -huh. um, but even for people who aren't Jewish, who find tremendous religious freedom, and that's not always perfect and easy, um, but in many ways, it's better there than it is in other countries. Um, you know, I want to see that version of Israel flourish, along with the egalitarian traditional Judaism that is so precious to us in our lives. Um, yeah, I want that to be. 
um, and I'm honored to continue to have the chance to be amongst the the group that tries to continue to have it happen. Um, we are supported by each other, and I feel supported by all of you, so thank you. Fa fascinating presentation. Thank you so much, Rabbi Skolnick, for sharing your, your time, your insight, your personal thoughts, and your wisdom with all of us this evening. Uh, thank, thank you, you to our technical guru also, Bruce Fagan, for making this presentation possible. Uh, also, I want to thank everybody uh, and share how grateful I am for all of you for joining with us and keeping Israel on your mind. Uh, we at the FJMC continue to be committed to keeping our friends informed of current events in Israel, to make our communities aware of Israel's history, and to assist our friends to advocate for Israel. And if you have any ideas for future Israel on My Mind webinars, or would like to write a personal reflection, please reach out to me at kruben at fjmc.org. Thanks again, and have a good evening.